Thank you, Mr. Lukic, for your uh, kind uh, words of introduction. As some of you may know, I've just returned from several days in uh, Bosnia. I have uh, been at this incredibly painful site of the recent mass excavations in Tomasica. I, have, I went to the camp, or what remains of it, in, in Omarska, and I was in Prehidor to met, meet with uh, representatives of Israel and other victims groups, whom I have also met in Sarajevo. Um, I, uh, nothing uh, brings uh, into relief the work that we are doing in the tribunal as much as seeing those, uh, visiting the site of those uh, unspeakable atrocities. And it was only through justice here at The Hague to which you have contributed so much that we can uh, face those uh, atrocities in a way looking not towards the past, but looking towards the future. Let me um, greet here uh, Lord Bonomi, a very distinguished colleague of mine, who has made an incredible contribution at The Hague uh, towards uh, reforming our rules. He has served on several working groups on reforms, and we are all ever so grateful to him. And I'm so pleased to see here my distinguished colleagues, uh, Judge Sekule and Judge Ramarason, and I'm pleased to hear that other uh, uh, ICTY judges will participate in the program. So uh, let me start, but before starting, let me apologize in advance. I will have to leave right after my speech because I have to go to the Security Council to which I have to report next week. Uh, excellences, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, this past spring, on 25 May 2013, we marked an important milestone, the passage of 20 years since the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia by the United Nations Security Council in Resolution 827. In the months that have followed, we have commemorated this milestone here at The Hague and in the former Yugoslavia with exhibits, working level meetings, and conferences. And I'm delighted to take part in this ADC ICTY conference today, as it provides yet another opportunity for us all to reflect upon the legacy of the ICTY in this, the 20th year since its establishment. When the ICTY was created, of course, many had their doubts as to what it could or would, or would accomplish, and whether the bold ideals embodied in Resolution 827 and reflected in the Tribunal Statute would become a reality. Over the years, the Tribunal has faced a number of challenges, both big and small. But as we gather here today, I am proud to report that the ICTY has put to rest the early doubts and achieved far more than many would have expected two decades ago. Indeed, many of the advancements made since 1993 in the world of international criminal justice were made possible thanks to the groundbreaking example set by the tribunal and when the tribunal eventually closes its doors, as it will before long, it will leave behind an important legacy. In some respects, this legacy is quite tangible. As a result of its trials and thanks to the efforts of both the prosecution and the defense, the tribunal has become the guardian of an extraordinary quantum of evidence and information concerning the events, the said events, during the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia. This unparalleled compilation of material will serve students and researchers for generations to come. Over the past two decades, the tribunal has also crafted practical processes and procedures 
to address a wide range of responsibilities, including the enforcement of sentences, the transfer of accused persons across state borders, and the protection of victims and witnesses. As the first international criminal court of the modern era, the ICTY's advances in the relations to these and other key court management matters have served as valuable models for other international courts and indeed for judiciaries and practitioners in national jurisdictions as well. These advances and the expertise the tribunal and its staff have developed in making these policies and procedures operational are also an important part of our legacy. More fundamentally, the ICTY has demonstrated that it is possible to try even the most complex of cases involving allegations of some of the most horrible crimes imaginable and brought against senior military and political leaders and to do so not once or twice, but time and time again. And of course, through hundreds of decisions and judgments, the ICTY has established key precedents in the area of international criminal and humanitarian law, precedents that clarify the scope of customary international law. Our rulings on matters of international criminal and humanitarian law have not only been applied in the tribunal, but have informed the work of other international courts and of judicial authorities, military and political advisors, and practitioners in domestic jurisdictions. But this is not all of our tribunal's legacy. Although the ICTY is a court mandated to try individuals for serious violations of international humanitarian law, in trying these cases, our court has also prided itself in having at its core a deep commitment to respect for human rights and for due process of law in particular. Fair trial rights, such as the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty, the right to a fair and public hearing, are not simply at the core of our statute. They are and continue to be a fundamental concern, the import of which informs how trials and appeals are conducted day in and day out, and the structure and myriad services provided by the registry of the tribunal. Fair trial rights are the focus of a great many of our decisions and judgments, and our rulings in this regard embrace a range of topics, from the sufficiency of an accused notice of the nature and cause of the charge against him, to the adequacy of the time and facilities granted for the preparation of his defense, to the availability of translations of certain documents and judgments in a language that the accused can understand. My fellow judges and I have weighed such questions as the right of the accused, of an accused, to represent himself on appeal, the scope of the principle of the equality of arms, and the standard for establishing fitness to stand trial. In its 2001 appeal judgment in the Celebici case, for example, the ICTY's appeals chamber concluded that in the absence of express statutory safeguards and warnings, an accused silence could not be considered in the determination of guilt or innocence. In the Furunzia appeal judgment, the appeal chamber considered the right to a reasoned opinion. And in a 2007 decision in Perlich, the tribunal weighed questions involving the admissibility and the evaluation of evidence. In addressing these and other fair trial questions, we have turn, turned time and again to the standards set by international human rights conventions, 
by the European Court of Human Rights and by other key human rights bodies and instruments, weaving, inter weaving international human rights law not simply into the fabric of our own jurisprudence, but into the practical example we set for other international courts and tribunals and for courts in domestic jurisdictions. This centrality of human rights law and of fair trial principles to the work of our tribunal is undeniably an important advancement as compared with the approach of earlier courts trying the accused of war crimes and other violations such as the tribunals established at Nuremberg in the wake of the Second World War. To be sure, many may disagree with the outcome of individual decisions and judgments issued by the ICTY. But, by, but I believe that no matter one's view on individual rulings, it is abundantly clear that the respect for fair trial rights and concern for the paramount importance of ensuring fair proceedings have been central to all that the tribunal has done over the course of the past 20 years. The evident centrality of fair trial guarantees and due process to our proceedings has been and will no doubt continue to be another vital part of our legacy, both for other international criminal courts and for countries, for courts in countries around the world. Why, one may ask, does this matter? Why is there such a focus on fair trial rights? It is because, to my mind, without a fair trial, without a fair process, there is neither justice nor accountability. This is true for any court of law worthy of its name. But given the high profile of the cases that come before our tribunal and the nature of the alleged crimes at issue, it is all the more important, important that we ensure that our proceedings are scrupulously fair and governed by the sober application of the law and the rigorous consideration of the evidence put before us. Ensuring the fairness of the proceedings is, of course, the responsibility of the judges of the tribunal and it is a, res a responsibility that my colleagues and I take very seriously. But judges are not the only ones who are guardians of the fairness of the tribunal's proceedings. The parties who appear before us, including both the prosecution and the defense, play an invaluable role in this regard. As you are no doubt aware, the tribunal's founding documents and rules reflect a combination of different legal traditions. But the tribunal's approach to matters of procedure was indisputably influenced early on by the common law adversarial system. Even as, it approach, as its approach to evidentiary matters showed the impact of continental civil law traditions. Others may disagree, but to my mind, the tribunal and its proceedings have benefited tremendously from this adversarial structure and from the rigorous advocacy by all parties that it invites. Defense counsel bef appearing before the tribunal are indisputably vigorous advocates for their clients and their clients' interests as they are ethically required to be, and the tribunal greatly benefits from this robust representation. The role of counsel in identifying and presenting careful, researched arguments concerning the potential violations of fair trial guarantees and of the law more generally is invaluable to the chamber's own ability to consider and address these issues. The committed engagement and considerable efforts of defense counsel in service of their clients are thus crucial 
not just to the functioning, but to the credibility of both the tribunal and its work. The part played by the prosecution is equally important. This is not simply because it falls to the prosecution to bring the cases that form the core of the tribunal's statutory mandate and to make cogent and careful submissions on all matter of issues before the chambers, just as the defense does. It is also because, as the tribunal's appeals chamber recognized more than 13 years ago, the prosecutor and his staff are in essence, and I quote, ministers of justice assisting in the administration of justice, unquote, with all of the considerable responsibilities to ensure the fairness of the proceedings that this significant role entails. In sum, the tribunal's central focus on fair trial rights and due process of law represents one of the most significant innovations in international justice in the modern era. And if its precedents, both practical and jurisprudential, constitute one of the most significant aspects of the tribunal's legacy, as I believe they do, the tribunal's achievements in this regard are not the institutions alone. These achievements and its, this legacy are also due, and indeed they are thanks to, the efforts and dedication of the worthy advocates who come before the tribunal and the seriousness of purpose with which they approach the trials. I recognize that the role of counsel before a court is rarely easy, and that appearing before an international criminal court like ours may involve novel challenges, long hours, and the scope of work rarely, if ever, seen in domestic proceedings. Please know, however, that all of you in the audience who appear before the tribunal have my sincere admiration and the respect for your dedication to your work, to the principles and laws that guide us, and to international justice. Your role in helping to ensure the tribunal's commitment to principles of fairness and due process have been critical to the ICTY's achievements in this respect. And for this, in particular, I salute you and I thank you. As we move forward with today's discussion of legacy, I hope that all of you know that the tribunal's legacy is very much your legacy as well. And I thank you.